Imagine the transformation of our lives, communities, and nation by spending an entire weekend in the presence of Jesus. Well, why not join us for our very first Encounter Conference weekend right here in the Isle of Man, March 13th and 14th at the Villa Marina. It's gonna be a life-changing few days together, not just with the Living Hope team, but also with our good friend, Jonathan Conrath, as he ministers in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Moses once said to God, I'm not gonna budge an inch unless your presence goes with us. And as a church today, we know it's gonna be the presence of Jesus that's gonna transform our lives and our nation. If you're coming from maybe the UK or Ireland, we'd love to host you over the weekend with the church family. So please get online, let's register as soon as possible, and let's believe God for an amazing time together. I hope you've all had a fantastic Christmas and New Year break. Have you had a good time? Can I say Happy New Year? Happy 2015 to everybody. If you're visiting us today, and a special warm welcome. The first Sunday of the year being with Living Hope Community Church in Douglas. What better way to spend the first Sunday of the new year? Probably about 8,000 other better ways, but you're here. And we're blessed. So it's great to be family together. I'm so excited about the church this year. I've been praying and seeking God and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me. I don't know what it all means, but um, I'm really seeking God this year. We're just on a new thing. And it was so encouraging this morning to hear the prophetic, a great number of words. We, we had so many we couldn't use them all. Prophetic song, a prophetic tongue with a great interpretation. I think it's God actually saying to us, look, this year, if you put Jesus first, if you put my son first, then I'm going to meet you. That's his promise. If Jesus is first in our lives, then we know the Holy Spirit's there because it's only by the Holy Spirit that we're enabled to say Jesus is Lord. That's what the Scripture says. So with the Holy Spirit present among us, us glorifying Jesus, I think the Father's going to do amazing things. Are we excited about that? Have we got some faith? I hope so. So this morning, I want to talk to us a little bit about waiting on God, what it means to wait on God. This is a one-off message. Once a year, first Sunday of the new year, I get to do whatever I want. So Jonathan's not here, so I can preach on whatever I want. And I've had this word in my heart since September, and I've never had an opportunity to preach it. But this morning, it's the opportunity Yay! Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we just pray now that you would unlock something for us. You would unlock something from your word, from your spirit, something that will help us to grow in you this year and to see amazing things happen. So give us fertile hearts, fertile minds, and fertile tongues to speak your word. Amen. Well, many of us are waiting for something. In fact, I would probably guess that almost all of us are waiting for God on something. I've been waiting 26 years to work in the church. And that's happened now after 26 years of waiting. But lots of us have got things that we're waiting for. It might be unanswered prayers. It might be things in the church. It might be sickness. It might be healing that that you're waiting for. But lots of us are waiting for things. But we're not very good at waiting, are we? Humans are not very good at waiting. I know this because there's this incredible thing that happens when Christians get behind the wheel of a car. They suddenly turn into Christian Frankenstein monsters. And all of our natural impatience comes out. My youngest daughter was crossing the road in Huddersfield where she's at university, and she was just about to step across into the road. She wasn't really thinking, which is kind of like Megan, but she, she stepped into the road and then she realized that there was a car coming. 
And so she quickly stepped back. And as this car came past, the driver, his face contorted with rage. Just a red mist descended on him. And it beep, 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 you, and it's shouting at her. And Megan was like this, and, and the car carried on with this guy waving angrily at her. And then she thought, he's familiar. <laughs> and she realized he was a guy from her church. <laughs> what is it that makes us so impatient? It's like if you're on the, in the airport queue. You know when you're in the airport queue waiting to get through security? I, the spirit of impatience comes over me, I have to say. Um, grace, I need constant grace when I'm going through the security in the airport. I think I've conquered it. But have you noticed how when you're waiting, most people behind you are inappropriately close? <laughs> you, you feel them pushing up, rubbing up behind you. And, and you just want to turn and say to them, look, I know you, but I don't know you that well. We've only just met, you know? Keep a safe distance from me. And it's our natural impatience because we're wanting to get through. We're not actually really thinking about being rude or anything like that. It's just that we're, we're in a hurry. And it's a very overlooked aspect of the church. You know, Saul failed to wait properly for Samuel and it cost him his throne. And when was the last time you heard it said of a church leader like myself... Um, he's a great leader. He's always waiting. It's not something we often say, is it? We often judge our church leaders by activity, not by their waiting on God. You listen to what people talk about when it comes to church leadership. They often talk about, oh, you know, he's on the go all the time. You know, he's putting on events. He, he's chasing after people. He, he's posting things on Facebook all the time. No names, no pack drill. But we rarely value waiting on God. And actually, I think it's a very overlooked aspect. If you look at David, King David, in the Psalms, he spoke of waiting so often. He said, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. And not just David. Isaiah talks about, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Even when God was silent after the destruction of Jerusalem and there was terrible suffering amongst the people of God. In Lamentations, probably written by Jeremiah, it talks about in um, chapter 3, verses 24 to 26, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Did you hear about the guy who was driving along in his car? And as he's driving along, there's a woman on the side of the road, and she shouts, Pig! And he winds down his window, and he says, Cow! And then as he goes around the corner, he crashes in car his car into this massive pig, and the car's totaled and destroyed. See, we're in a hurry to know what is happening. But actually, sometimes God's telling us that something's around the corner and we have to wait on him to hear it. Don't crash into the pig around the corner because you're in a hurry to say something rather than listen. Two ears, one mouth, use them in proportion, I was told. So waiting on God is something that we need to do. It's something that can be good for us. Why can it be good for us? Well, we're not waiting on salvation because salvation has come in the form of Jesus. We're not waiting on the presence of God because the Holy Spirit 
is freely given. Jesus talks about how willing the Father is to, the, to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. But what we are waiting for sometimes is for the purposes of God to unfold in our lives. It's not an inactive waiting. It's actually an active waiting, seeking God for his purposes in our lives. A bit like the disciples had to wait. Jesus told them, um, to wait, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus asked the disciples to wait on him, and then something powerful came in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's actually pretty easy if you look at Scripture to see why waiting is good for us. I've already said that um, the Word says it's ble- those that await are blessed. And it's good to wait. But there's a series of things we develop and learn through waiting. The first is our true motives are actually uncovered. Jesus talks about how nothing is covered up. So as we're waiting, he's testing our desires. Our true motivations are uncovered. It builds perseverance. And what does perseverance bring? Character and hope. So we develop perseverance while we're waiting. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Galatians 5. So we develop patience, which is a fruit of the Spirit. How much more glorious will airport queues be if the fruits of the Spirit are breaking out amongst us? You can stand behind me in peace and harmony because the fruit of patience is developing in my spirit. It's part of God's discipline and transformation. We're being transformed to become like Jesus. Well, as we wait on God, that's one of the things that is happening. It's part of God's discipline and part of him transforming us. And of course, a great thing about it is it increases our dependence on God. As we're waiting, we're dependent on him. We're calling out to him. And actually, it increases our dependence on one another as well. Great phrase from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Sometimes when we're waiting on God and going through things, he's preparing us for something extraordinary. Something that seems hard at the time is actually part of preparation. You know, and I, I don't need to ask you, I know many of you will have this testimony. I certainly have this testimony in in my life where I've been through terrible illness. But now I look back and I see that God was using that time. I'm not saying God gave me the sickness, but God prepares us as we wait on him for something greater as we put our hope and our faith in him. It's breeding hope. It's developing hope and character. So waiting on God can be a good thing, but What I want to talk about briefly today is not why we wait, but how we can wait effectively. You agree with me now that waiting on God is something scriptural, yeah? Yeah. So how do we wait on God? What's the important aspects of waiting on God? Well, just a couple of quick things this morning, which I think are going to help us. Because it's the secret of being used by God. Waiting effectively and having our spirits and our hearts in the right place is the secret of being ready to, you, to be used by God when his purposes start to unfold. Anyone would like to guess how many references there are in the NIV to the word heart? 700 I have from the lady at the front. Anyone like to go higher than 700? 1,026 from the gentleman who's overestimated. <laughs> 850. Well, depends which version of the Bible you look at. But my, by my estimation and Google, 743 references in the NIV to heart and the word heart. So Janet's in tune with the Spirit this morning. You're nearly there, just 43 out. You see, the secret of waiting on God is in the heart. It's in our heart. The Bible focuses so much on the heart. 
And there's two things that I want to draw out. And the first is keeping the right secrets in our heart. The question of purity. We've talked about it um, this morning. And God has really, I think, prophetically revealed to us the need to have um, him prioritized in our heart. Because you don't have to look far in Scripture to see that God tests the heart. It's the place of testing. Proverbs 17 verse 3 says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. The crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 to 4, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests the heart. The heart is tested. And actually, if you read the tests of the heart, we're even probed at night. It says in Psalm 17 verse 3, Though you probe my heart and examine me at night, Though you test me, you will find nothing. I have resolved that my mouth will not sin. That's David. So even at night, our hearts are being probed by the Lord. We're being tested. You know, once I started to say I wanted to give more into following God, my heart was tested. Every motivation of my heart, I felt like God exposed It wasn't exposing. And I prayed with people. I shared with people. I saw my wife um, delivered. My family has been tested. There are tests that come because the Lord is testing our motivations. He's testing our hearts. You see, God searches and he understands every motivation we have. David at the end of his life, King David at the end of his life, where he gives his, his highest bit of wisdom to his son, Solomon. He says in 1 Chronicles 28, 20, verse 9, this is where he's sharing his learning. He knows that his, he's passing over his throne to Solomon. And he says, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion. That's what we talked about this morning. And with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. The Lord searches every Every heart and understands every motive. That's actually a little bit of a frightening concept. (laughs) Every heart is being searched by God. And he knows every motive behind every thought. And even in James, James writes in uh, chapter 4 verse 8, Come near to God and he will come near to you. That's That's a verse we often quote, isn't it? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But the rest of that verse says, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Purify your hearts. So drawing near to God who tests the heart involves us purifying ourselves before him. And you know, a purified heart, willingly submitted to God, can have amazing results. Incredible, profound results. How do I know this? Well, let's take a bad example and a good example in Scripture. So in Acts 8, Acts chapter 8, we meet Simon the sorcerer. You know Simon the sorcerer? And what Simon wants to do is he wants to buy the Holy Spirit. He says to Peter, give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And he offered them money. And what does Peter say in response? Well, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. What's disqualified him? His heart is not right before God. We just talked about how motivations are exposed before God. Well, Simon's motivations 
were impure. But let's take a different example, one from the Old Testament, King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. He was pulling together the remnants of the tribes of Israel for the feasts. And it talks about how Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David did. But as the people gathered, some of them were from the remnants of the northern tribes of Israel, and they weren't aware of all of the purification rituals and rites required of the law before um, God. So they were actually coming before God impure. And the penalty in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament law, for coming before God impure was death. So these people had come actually before God facing death because they were impure. Let's read what happens then when Hezekiah faces this situation. 2 Chronicles 30, 18 to 20. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. So they'd actually disobeyed God. But Hezekiah prayed for them saying, may the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets his heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we miss these powerful little truths in here. That a heart seeking God, a, a heart that was earnestly set before God, God was willing to overlook the fact that these people were impure under the law. The heart had overridden the law. Isn't that amazing? You see, a seeking heart, a pure heart, can influence God. It can move God's hand. If you look at some of the commentaries around this passage, the, the biblical commentaries, they, they talk about the heart. The, Morgan is one commentary. talks about this largeness of heart is always characteristic of men who are really in fellowship with God for it is in harmony with the heart of God. If you're deep in fellowship with God, your heart is in harmony with the heart of God. And Maya says, you, that's not Joyce Maya, by the way, you may not understand doctrine, creed, or right. So you may not understand all the doctrines, creed, or right, but be sure to seek God. No splendid ceremonial nor rigorous etiquette can intercept the seeking soul. So if our hearts are set on seeking God, then no legalistic attitudes towards churchiosity or churchianity can intercept us seeking God. The power of a heart set in seeking God is not to be underestimated. And it wasn't a one-off for Hezekiah, by the way. Um, when he repented of the pride in his heart later, God's, the Lord's wrath did not come upon them. So he had pride in his heart. He repented of it and God relented. His wrath did not come upon them. And even when the Gentiles were first given the Holy Spirit, when Paul talks to the council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, when he talks to the, the apostles, Peter, in his acceptance of the Gentiles and recognizing what God was doing, he actually says in Acts 15, 8, 8 and 9, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Their faith had purified their hearts. See, a pure heart allows us to come before God with confidence. If you want to come with confidence before the Lord, a pure heart, allow the Word and the Spirit to search your heart, to reveal the attitudes in your heart. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. 
For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I'm going to ask right now that you think about your heart. What's in your heart now? Is 2015 the moment to let go of some of the things that hold us back from a purified heart? You know, if we're carrying unforgiveness, if we're carrying bitterness towards other people, those are the things that are going to inhibit us before God. If we're living with a cynicism in our heart, that's exposed, that motive is exposed before God. If we're living half-heartedly towards Christ, that's exposed. All our motives and thoughts are exposed before God. Yet if we set those things aside and dedicate our hearts to him, then we come before the, the Lord with a confidence, a power, a, a faith that we know he will meet us. And sometimes some of us carry pseudo-guilt you know, the, the enemy is an accuser of the brethren. And if we're carrying that in our heart, it's holding us back. Let go of it. The Lord is faithful. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Let go of the things in your heart that are going to hold you back. Confess them before the Lord. Purify your heart. And then you will have confidence in his presence. Whatever comes will then be from him. 1 John 3, 19 to 22. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. How great is that? That as we come with purified hearts, we have confidence before God. A pure heart means confidence before God. And waiting on him in all our circumstances means we can wait confidently. Okay, so a purified heart. Now, to finish... I want us to have purified hearts, but I want us to have God dreams. Because one of the things that I think it, Scripture unlocks to us is that if we have God desires in our heart, the heart is the store. It's the place where God looks to see what's going on. R.T. Kendall says the heart is the seat of faith. After all, it's where salvation is found. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you will be saved. The heart is the place. And let, let's have a look at some biblical characters. Where did Mary store the things that she saw when Jesus was born? In her heart. In Luke 2, verse 19, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And I'm sure that helped her when the crunch came. I'm sure she had that store of things in her heart which just saw her through. What about David? Well, David had in his heart to build a house, a place of rest. It was where David stored the plans of God. It's where um, the, the temple plans, David held them in his heart. His dream of building a place where the presence of God would live permanently was stored in his heart. Paul holds dreams in his heart. Paul, it says in Romans 10 verse 1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is they, that they may be saved. Paul held a heart desire for the Jews to return, to come to know the Messiah. It was in his heart that he held that. And he also encourages dreams to be held. He, he talks about leadership where he says, here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. 
See, heart follows treasure. What we set as our dreams, that's where our treasure will be. What we store in our heart. When some people in this congregation started to dream about young people being touched for Christ and being um, witnesses to their generation, that was just a dream in somebody's heart. Warren and Claire in particular carried a dream to see young people touched for Christ. And now what do we see? We see God has seen that dream and is beginning to unfold it because it was held in a heart committed to the kingdom. And this was when in Northern Ireland, this is our young people praying in a pretty rough area. Was it? Yeah. (laughs) A pretty scary area. And our young people are gathered in that area, praying for that community, being the feet of good news on the mountain. What's the dream stored in your heart today? You know, are you, have you got a God dream in your heart? Or are you just wandering through life? If I said to you, what is the thing that you're believing God to do and that you're storing? I remember going to a, a little concert in a small sports hall in Swindon with this band. There was probably 100 200 people there maybe and this band were giving it everything that they uh, they had and they had a song called Revival Revival Town and they were singing it out and here we were in this little sports hall and the lead singer of that band he said oh I write a few songs he's quite a humble guy and that became delirious it's reached millions of people um, across nations great songs powerful anthems Incredible witness to a generation. What about Alpha? We talked about Alpha today. Do you know how Alpha started? It was a little dinner party in London with Nicky Gumbel, and they were talking about how they could spread the word, how they could share the gospel. Do you know how many people Alpha has reached now? 24 million people have done Alpha. 169 countries 112 languages. Wow. See what God can do with a dream? A dream in a heart fully committed to him. If, if your heart is fully committed to God, you're purified so you're confident and you're storing a dream in there, who knows what God will do with it? Look at David and Joseph. They stored dreams in their hearts and God used them powerfully because... It says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, the Lord's eyes scan the whole world to strengthen those who are committed to him with all their hearts. The eyes of the Lord are scanning the world looking for fully committed hearts. You can expect your dreams to be tested, but God, you know that verse I used there about the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. We always think of that as exposing the crud that needs to come to the top. But actually, the Lord's looking for gold and silver in hearts as well. And if he finds gold and silver in hearts in terms of faith, he might use that. I have a vision for the church in the Isle of Man. And I tell you what, I'm, I'm storing in my heart revival in the Isle of Man. Because if God decides he wants to break out here and he's scanning across all the hearts here, I want him to find it in my heart so that I can be used. I want my heart to be storing something that's going to unfold and release the purposes of God like it did for Nicky Gumbel, like it did for Martin Smith and Delirious, like it did for people like Liz Ward, actually, who wanted to be free. Liz stored a desire, a dream in her heart to be free. And God said, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. So what's stored in your heart this morning? Is it something gold and silver that the Lord can use? And as we go into 2015, let's believe for what God could do for each one, for you, for me. What's your dream? What's your God desire stored in your heart? 
Is it to be a church planter? You know, do, you, do you dream of being a church planter? Why not? Is it to be on mission? Is it to reach the marginalized of our society? Is it to be an intercessor? You want to pray. You have a heart for praying. Is it to be a generous giver in the church? Then start with a dream in your heart, a small dream, and see what God will do with it. Because when God's purposes unfold, he's understanding motives. He's testing hearts. He's looking for willing hands because he's partnering with us for his purposes in his grace and his mercy. Psalm 37 verse 4. And I love this in the Amplified Version because it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. What's the secret petition in your heart? Because if we want this to happen, folks, we start by delighting ourselves in the Lord. That's the starting place. With purified hearts, with God dreams, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he will see that and he will give us the desires and secret petitions of our heart. A heart set for God and he will work with those secret petitions. Like Cornelius. You know Cornelius that Peter came to see when the Gentiles... The, the first breakout, God was looking for someone that he could use to break open the, his purposes at that time. And it says of Cornelius that he, was, he gave generously to those in need and he prayed to God regularly. He was devout. And he became a pivotal figure in the spread of the gospel, in the growth of the church. Just a Roman, just a Roman centurion, but a devout Roman centurion, God-fearing, generous, giving in need, praying regularly, a heart in the right place, devoted, and God used him. That could happen to any of us. If we, our hearts are in the right place, devoted, delighting in the Lord, I believe God will use us. Amen? Well, we're going to finish now, but this is the New Year message. This is, this is better than the Queen's Christmas message. Perhaps not delivered as well, but who cares? The content is better. And I want us to set our hearts at this, this start of the year with an expectancy, with a faith, declaring a belief in our God. Perhaps Paul could, or someone could come and pray. Pray, play for me. You can pray for me as well. Because if we're found in watchful service, Jesus said it, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. So as we wait on God for 2015, let's wait with the right secrets in our heart, with purified hearts confident before the Lord and with God dreams. Perhaps we could just close our eyes. I'm going to ask us to stand with me. And if you're a leader in the church, a worship leader, so if you're a worship leader, a life group leader, or if you are leading in any way in the church, you know, when David spoke to the people of God, he actually asked the leaders, first of all, if they would come and consecrate their hearts before the Lord. And when the leaders came and consecrated their hearts before the Lord, the people rejoiced and they came forward and they consecrated themselves. So I'm going to ask our leaders, if you're willing, guys, would you come and consecrate your hearts before God this morning? Would you come and demonstrate to the people that in 2015, we are going to have wholehearted devotion before the Lord. We're going to set our hearts to be pure and we're going to carry God dreams for the family of God. And if you are in the family, why don't you stretch out a hand to your leaders? These guys are going to serve us and I believe God is going to meet them. 
Thanks, guys. We, I so love you guys. <laughs> you know, I love, I love what God is doing in these lives. Let's just take a moment, just take a second, just to purify our hearts. To say, Lord, search our, ser- search our every motivation, our every thought. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for every person who's responded here this morning. I thank you for each and every one, Lord. I thank you for wholehearted devotion to you. I thank you for purified, confident lives. Father, I pray that you would release your spirits, purposes, and anointing on each and every life. Lord God, that you would unfold the wonders of your kingdom and plans through, through them and through those that they shepherd and serve. And Lord God, each would know your presence in power. And Lord, I pray that if there's a dream, a God dream in our hearts, that you would see it. And when the time comes, you would use us. Use us powerfully to further your kingdom in Jesus' name. And if you're not a Christian this morning, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you know, the the path of someone who doesn't have their heart set for Jesus is eternal separation from God. It says the the wages in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is the gift of God through Jesus. So this morning, if you're not a Christian, while we've got every eyes, every eye closed and every head bowed, if you want to give your life to Christ, you can do that right now. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That confession, that heart confession will save you. So if you haven't given your life to Christ, perhaps you'd like to just raise your hand. Every eye is closed now, please, so that I I can see. If you want to give your life to Christ now, I don't want to miss an opportunity. Okay. Just wait a sec. Thank you, Jesus.